Hello and welcome to the FEZ Show, a new daily show that will be running from Monday to Friday as we all adjust to this new life under lockdown. Joining me today are the members of the FEZ crew, which are William Dodds, Edward Hunter and Jack Pickering, also known as Pico, just to avoid the confusion between both Jacks. Yep. Hello boys, how are you? Hello. Good, thanks, Jack. Yeah, I'm good, thank you, Jack. Yeah, 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 but yeah. This is going to be a mess in terms of like who, who speaks in what, what order. But no, I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be great. No, nah, I'm sure it will be. Obviously, how's how's lockdown life treating you? Obviously, we can, we can go out once, which is actually quite lucky in the UK. Whereas other countries like Spain, you can't even go outside. So how how is self isolation? How is lockdown life treating you? Oh, well, it's not too much different to before, actually, Jack. <laughs> in my case. <laughs> Yeah, I, I went to um, uh, I, I I went to sh I went to shop for the first time uh, yesterday, and uh, and everyone at Aldi was was uh, was very good at the social distancing. So there was like a there was like a queue out out of the car park, but there was two meters between everyone. So very good. I I did some gardening. Oh, nice! Which was fun. Um, yeah. That was enjoyable, and uh, yeah, otherwise just staying inside, staying out of the staying way. Staying safe. To be honest, a member of my family's ill, so I'm in the 14 day kind of not allowed to go out of the house at all sort of stage. Well, I hope I hope they get well. I think we're pretty much. I think everyone here is pretty lucky that we haven't lost anyone. Or it doesn't or seem too anyone. serious. It's just the guidelines say if one of your family members gets sick, you can't leave. So there we go. <laughs> yes. So I'm hoping everyone else at home is doing a great job. Obviously, stay home. Um, wherever you are, obviously, if we stay home together, we'll be back and hopefully we'll be back talking racing, which is what we're going to be talking about for the next half an hour. So first thing I want to talk about, boys, is the season, because obviously we're in this period right now. June, Berlin is the next race, but with Germany having 100,000 cases confirmed of coronavirus, it's actually going to be quite difficult, I think, like moving the season on how do we think this season is going to be resolved because we only need to do actually a couple more races and then we can call the season quits so jack how, how do you think that we can resolve the situation that we're in well yeah one of uh, uh, uh one of the uh, one of the ideas that i've been thinking of is um basically just scrap the kind of season that we have right now um but because we need we need six events to create a championship. It says in uh, it says in the FE guidelines. Um, so we need two. So we need so we need two more events because we've had five races, but Diri was a double header, so it's four. Um, so I reckon that they should schedule a Berlin race and a Valencia race as TBD. Right, uh, uh, right now, don't don't give it a date. Give it give it a rough idea of when they of, of, of when we want to, uh, uh, of when we want to race. Fingers crossed that'll be end of September, early October. Obviously, this is a fluid situation, and we don't know which is, which is why it's not really possible. But the thing is, with London, um, the uh, the XL Centre has now been turned into a temporary hospital. So it's going to be a it's going to be difficult to go there uh, d during it during all this uh, d during the crisis, um, and also New York. New York is a shipping port, so so they so so they may have designed the whole calendar over two days where New York where they cannot. Uh, where, uh, where they don't receive anything from the shipping port, and so it, it'll be a bit harder to do that. But so that me, so that leaves Berlin, which I think is rather feasible, and Valencia, where, which is where um all the Formula E cars are. Well, they they're currently in the Valencia circuit right now, so yeah, that's that's my idea. And Berlin, of course, is at Tempelhof Airfield as well, which is relatively isolated from the city centre. That's what I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about, in terms of extending the season, because we sort of did an exclusive a couple of weeks ago where, you know, F Formula E said they wanted the season to be done by September because then moving, well, they didn't really want to go into September because that sort of affects the preparation for season seven. So I was thinking if you, Berlin is a race, Will, where you could possibly push back, even London, even now that the XL is a Nightingale hospital, once, if this all finishes up by, say, let's fingers crossed June, July, you could take that hospital down, push London from its July, end of July spot into maybe end of August spot, and you could still possibly race in London. I'd be, um, uh, I'd be happy with that. Um, a, uh, a London E-Pre basically on my birthday. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd definitely be for that. <laughs> 
I think that's very contingent on the situation improving. Yes. Yeah. Go on, Will. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, no, as, as you said, I think with with London, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult situation to predict. Um, you know, we were initially told kind of, I know with, with football, the first example, that that was going to be kind of until the end of April that there was not going to be any football. But now that looks completely unrealistic. So I think no one really knows how long this kind of lockdown situation is going to go on. Initially it was three weeks, but it's looking more like in other countries probably about three months. So I, I think that it'll be very difficult, especially with the added situation of the uh, Excel Centre being turned into a hospital to see it going ahead in July. But yeah, if we can kind of fit it like at the end of August, we could even have like a back-to-back kind of double header towards the end of the season just to get more races in. Um, but yeah, I think that that kind of September, early September, late August time, I can see it potentially being a possibility, but obviously the most important thing is doing it at a time which is safe and yeah. hopefully when spectators can come um, because, you know, I think there are a lot of people like ourselves included who would have been really excited about having a, la- a race back in the UK um, that we could all kind of travel to very easily. So, um, yeah, I'll be hopefully we can get something towards the kind of end of August um, and I mean, if that is the case, then that means the situation is much better. But I think it's it's as as Pico said, it's a fluid situation and something we have to be wary of. Yeah, I agree with you, Will. That July looks really unrealistic for London, especially good festival speed that was supposed to happen a few weeks before, has now been postponed, basically by uh, Lord March, who runs the event. Basically, it's like a garden party uh, full of motorsport in his bank garden, but. Um, but the yeah the I I've, there's a lot, a lot of people have been saying that the Nightingale Hospital the the army came in I think and they built the hospital in about uh, well they built the hospital they put in the infrastructure into Excel which was already there in about nine days and a lot of people are saying oh well it was built in nine days so they can take it down in nine days ready for the race if everything settles down by July a that's not doesn't sound realistic and b I think uh, <laughs> the idea that the army would the army, the idea that the army would be draft, oh, all secret Formula E fans and would be drafted in to set up all the circuit and infrastructure in nine days is a bit unrealistic to me. Although Formula E did make a big point about the fact that they donated the barriers that they were going to use for the circuit have been used for, I think, some of the construction stuff for uh, uh, the uh, Nine Girl Hospital at Gexel. So, I think I think it could be taken down quite quickly. I I know Formula E tracks are completely difficult, different to taking a, a hospital down. But formally, we take three weeks to put up a racetrack. It takes three weeks to set it up. Um, that's probably part of the parcel of, you know, the setting up process, which people in cities actually don't like, that it actually takes like three weeks to set it up. Didn't but they shorten take... it down to two weeks for Paris as well? Uh, they may I, have done. I remember reading but at the same But at the same time, they take down the whole infrastructure within three days. So if you can sort of disassemble a whole racetrack in three days, but take three weeks to put it up, you might be able to take down a hospital a bit quicker. I don't know. It might be completely different. I'm completely um, like hypothesizing on that. That's all speculation. I think, I think yeah. something that's also probably should be considered is the fact that, you know, even if lockdown is over, they probably will still need the extra hospital capacity. Yeah. So I, I can see that something like temporary hospitals, they would actually be one of the last kind of temporary okay. measures to get removed. Um, I don't think that they will be kind of... I can't see a situation where bed capacity suddenly gets so much better to the extent that they can start taking down temporary hospitals. So that's definitely a concern. Um, yeah, selfishly, I would like London to go ahead, but I think, as, as Pico said, we could end up seeing some kind of new circuits brought onto the calendar that can be kind of turned around quite quickly that are pretty much yeah. already ready for a race just so we can get that that season finished um in time rather than perhaps um sticking with the with the current uh events that we've got on the calendar at the moment yeah i was thinking donnington actually because obviously formula e, and i still believe formula e have a headquarters at donnington so and i still think one or two teams might be, still even be based at donnington park so or still have like that little factory thing open rather than closing, which most of them have now closed. So even going there, I don't know how that would work in terms of energy efficiency because it isn't the most energy efficiency track, but we did test there for two years. So I reckon it it could be doable. If they needed to get some races done, we could go back to Donington. I don't think though, to sort of like wrap this up, I I doubt 
that we'd go to New York because New York in America is the worst affected. Yeah, it's the epicenter, right, Jack? It, it's it's the worst. So I can't see us going to New York this season. I think the doubleheader will will have to be scrapped and we'll have to make up other races, whether it is at Donington or Valencia or or going to Berlin at, at Tempelhof. So I, I I can't see New York happening. Yeah, and I think what you said about Donington is a good point because I read that Donington, Brands Hatch, and Silverstone are venues that Formula E are under consideration to possibly use if they can. Yeah, Formula E said, Formula e said that they're looking at possibilities of looking at new cities and seeing if they can, you know, if they, it'd be amazing. For example, I don't know if any like I don't I haven't followed the Scandinavia. I know they they had like fight it was creeping up in Scandinavia, but I'm I'm pretty sure. Um, there were cities over there like Oslo's in Sweden. Uh, well, Oslo's obviously in Norway, but Sweden and, and Denmark <laughs> were were um, were looking at were looking were potentially looking at races. So it, it, I know Copenhagen has definitely stated interest in in hosting a race. So if, even if we could go to a city which is less are affected by coronavirus in the future, in in the late August or in that July period, that, that you know it, that could help if if planning permission and and stuff like that could happen. It's weird, actually. The coronavirus almost affects Formula E more because of the fact that obviously it's reliant on, on these kind of like temporary city tracks, and kind of a lot of it is, is kind of built around that, like a lot of social interaction, which is obviously not something that's possible. But I know that Formula One are looking at potentially like, doing multiple races at Silverstone with different, um, different layouts on the circuit. So. Um, I, I think that that's probably one to one to look out for is, is just using these kind of permanent tracks that that would be ready to, to use. Just to get just to get across the finishing line, to pardon the pun in a sense. Just to get those uh, those eight events done. Uh, yeah, isn't it? Isn't it six events technically? Yeah, I think it's six. Them? Sorry, events, six events. Think, yeah. yeah, it's eight for Formula One. Six for it to officially count as a championship, so or yeah. so that yeah, because the Costa can't just win it by default after five. Yeah, but I imagine I imagine they would have end up probably doing looking to do double headers just to get as many races in as possible. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think everything will be a double header now, if especially if you go to permanent circuits. Like, there's no. There's no excuse for not doing a double header. So say we go to Donington, it makes sense to do a race at this. And if we do go to Valencia and everything's in fine in Spain, it makes sense to do a double header. Yeah. Berlin so then even if you manage, sense. even if you manage six events, you still got kind of like a nine race season, which is yeah. not not terrible. Exactly. Uh, it's better than uh, I finish it well. We can't finish now, essentially. Otherwise, the championship null and void. Um, you know, it's, we're in a completely different situation to like Formula One, for example, who haven't even started their season. They could do something more incredible. Whereas Formula E, just we need to finish the season, otherwise we are facing a null and void championship, which nobody wants. And it's obviously different with with motorsport than it is with other sports because you have the new generation of cars and everything that goes into preparing a season. It's not like, for example, like football or cricket or rugby, like. You don't change the rules and the regulations every season. You know, they could just put it on pause for as long as they want, really, and just start up again. Whereas yeah. just, I don't, with motorsport, it's just it's not that simple. Yeah, they are talking obviously about freezing the powertrains and using the same powertrains for next season. Obviously, that wouldn't help the likes of Neo, for example, oh, who no. are using a season five a season five powertrain from Dragon, for example. So they'd be still be using the same powertrain going into season seven. They'd be, I suppose, they wouldn't have as much of a deficit because everyone's else using the same powertrain but everyone else will move that powertrain on whereas neo won't, won't really move on at all so they they wouldn't want that but i want to sort of move away from this now because i think we've covered it nicely so over the past well neo could just a... buy from another manufacturer but you're right <laughs> that's true but moving on um what i wanted to talk about now is we picked our top five drivers, okay? The top five drivers of the season so far. And there was a little bit of controversial in there because there were some drivers that we missed out and there's always going to be when you have to, you know, pick five names. Five names across Formula E when there's so many drivers that are performing so great. Why did so, you force us to choose, Jack? Ugh. I know, I know. But it was a great, it was a great conversation that we had. And I'm going to start it off because... Uh, I was the one who spearheaded Lucas Degrassi being in this list because I think he really deserved being in this list. So for me, why I put Lucas Degrassi as number five is because that Audi, that Audi is so slow. It, Audi have probably produced the worst car in Formula E that they have ever produced in, in, in this season. And Degrassi is doing wonders with it. You know, 
to get the podium in Diria, obviously it probably set him up for failure, that podium in Diria, actually, because obviously then that put him in Group 1. So by him being in Group 1, the qualifying was never going to be there because he had the worst track conditions at, this, at that time. So then he was qualifying way down the order, like 20th, 15th, 16th, that's where he was. But he's still getting that car through, doing fantastic overtakes getting into the points and rescuing tons of points for, for Audi. And whereas Daniel Apt, on the, on the other hand, like has been in the qualifying group twos, group threes, and hasn't really done much for the car because the car's not that great. You know, I don't know if they've used this time period to probably try and figure out what is wrong with their car, Audi, if they best they can before everything go, went into lockdown in Germany. But I really think Lucas de Grassi has just been brilliant this season. Yeah, I think that's um, you've made a fair case there, Jack. I would say that um, when you said that Audi made the worst car they've ever made in their history, um, I, I was just thinking of. Uh, I thought you were about to say that they've made the well, worst car in their Formula E history, not their, yeah. not, their, not, not in history history. I'm, well, I don't even know what that would be, but at the same time, I, I, I just think Lucas Degrassi's done a great job. Will you made a case for person who was in fourth? Who was in fourth? So uh, we went with Nick Nick De Vries in fourth. Um, which I think is another one that potentially some other people would, would disagree with because of the fact that he's actually had, I think, a couple of non-finishes and only two points finishes. Yeah, he's only got um, 18 points in total, isn't he? Yeah, he's he's actually been very unlucky so far. Um, you know, he had uh, a podium uh, stolen from him, I think, in Santiago because of uh, a power spike issue uh, that gave him a, a grid penalty and allowed Mitch Evans to, to take that podium. Um, and I think something that I've, I've looked at really is that, you know, compared to a lot of the other rookies who are coming into Formula E this season, he's really outperformed them. Um, when you look at the likes of, of Collado and, and Nico Muller and Brendan Hartley, that, that those types of people coming into Formula E, um, his, his performance has been significantly better. Obviously, the Mercedes is a, is a good car and uh, Van Dorn's shown that as well. But even against someone like Van Dorn, who, you know, is very highly rated before going into Formula One, and highly rated in Formula E as well. Uh, he's actually outqualified him in the last three events. Um, you know, Van Dorn only managed to outqualify him in, in Diria. And generally, he, he, he's looking like he, he's more racy as well, barring his, his um, couple of unlucky incidents. So I think he's someone who, you know, literally five races into his Formula E career has shown a huge amount of potential, a lot of speed, um, and I think that, yeah, he, he's really he's really deserving of it, considering his lack of experience in the sport and and yeah, kind of coming into it also with a new team who who won't have quite as much experience. I know they have the kind of uh, knowledge from the HWA days, but I think that nonetheless, it's been it's been really good from Derees. Yeah, I'd I'd have to agree. He's been he's been brilliant. I, that the drive in Santiago for me was brilliant when he he stole the podium effectively from Mitch Evans on on the final lap. But then obviously lost it for a power spike, which nothing yet he could do, and and that sets him back like five five like two places I think it was, um with the five second penalty. Um, but Jack, you went with the driver who was in third. So who did you pick? Yeah, um, w- uh, we went for Maximilian Gunther in uh in third. Uh, he's he's probably the least exper- He's definitely the least experienced of the Formula E front runners at the moment. Uh, he uh, he raced for Dragon last season. He uh, and, and had to sit out three races to um, for for Felipe Nasa to come in. However, when he came back in Rome, he he had a fantastic. I think he went through to Super Pole in Rome and then scored some points in Paris. And so you could see how how good he was then. And then he scored again in Bern, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, and BM- then BMW were caught in a problem because they they kind of lost their lead driver, um, r- uh, rather suddenly uh, d- uh, during the summer, and so they decided to take a risk on Max Gunter and they signed him up for uh, for this season, and it took him a while to get you. Uh, it uh, it didn't take him too long to get used to it to it he he didn't have a great first race in diria but the second race in diria he came second until he got a penalty for overtaking someone under the safety car um so uh 
Uh, he lost he, he lost 18 points there. And then the following race, he went on to win in Santiago. And uh, and, uh, and and he also had a second in the most recent race in Marrakesh. So, and he's only... Uh, he, he is behind his teammate, Alex Sims. However, uh, uh, however Alex Sims, despite... Uh, the win in Diria and a fantastic, um, and this uh, and a fantastic comeback in Mexico City. Uh, had had Max Gunter not had that second place stripped of him, he'd be four points behind the Costa at the top of the table. So he'd he'd be right in contention for this year's championship. Oh, but are we giving consolation and, and... points for bad luck now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, to be honest, to be honest with you, I think I think it's a good shout because. If you think about, it really annoyed me because I didn't think he did anything wrong. Technically, he did in in Diria, but at the same time, I felt everyone because everyone cheated the rules because obviously you're not allowed to take attack mode um, this season during a safety car period. But technically, the safety car period ended, but the race hadn't restarted, so everyone dived into that attack mode, and then he didn't, uh, and obviously took the places while everyone was going the long way around in attack mode. And I, I remember watching that race and I was like, you just that's just a massive loophole in the rules. Like, how can you say we're banning we're banning uh, attack mode used in during the safety car period, but then you allow them to immediately as it finishes, because they haven't actually crossed the safety car line yet, but the, whoever was leading the race at that time was the de facto safety car. They all took it. I was like, that's wrong. I thought they all broke the rules there. And that's what I mean. Like, I think it's a bit of a grey area, rules, isn't it? Uh, that really annoyed me. But the way the way the way it kind of transpired, it looked really stupid, and it, yes. it definitely looked like um, like Gunther was doing something wrong. But yeah, I thought that was really unfortunate. Um, yeah, I think I think it's just that he, like, his qualifying has been really really good as well against Sims, who's clearly a good qualifier. And I think just for someone in their second year coming in against um, someone who a lot of people after Diri were rating really highly in Sims, and obviously had a good season last year as well. Uh, yeah, I think Gunther is just just a really quick driver and someone I, I I can just see getting better as well you know he's still I think he must be the youngest driver on the grid yeah, yeah he is I he think is. for a long time App was the youngest driver but you're right I think he I think Gunther is a year or two younger than him so Ed you you had Antonio Felix da Costa as our Indeed number two the championship leader so we didn't go with him as number one why did we not go with him as number one why, why do you think he wasn't he isn't the best driver so far well Two is still pretty high up the list, to be honest. Uh, well, yeah, I'd agree. Da Costa had a... I think Diria was a bit of a write-off because uh, first race was a bit anonymous. Second race, there was an incident with Bremi, which he got the penalty for. Still snuck into, I think, a point in the end because of all the chaos. Then his season really got going in Santiago, where him and John Rick Verne qualified, I think. He qualified about 10th, I think. Over, as, over, as the race went on, worked his way up. Uh, and fought with Gunther for the win. Gunther eventually um, outsmarted him, as we all remember, on the last lap because uh, Da Costa basically overheated his car trying to get by Gunther. And but it was still a good performance, even though Da Costa was really annoyed at the time they didn't get the win. Then Mexico, he d- came second again after basically fighting Jonic Verne all the way through the race, and there was a bit of team orders involved. But eventually he came out on top, put pressure on Sam Bird. Sam Bird crashed out. Uh, <laughs> over to express in Premier fairly straightforwardly and among others uh, narrowly avoiding that incident with De Vries I remember as well and then of course there was um, uh, the, most, the most impressive performance I have to say was uh, Marrakesh where he qualified on pole despite despite it being in group one uh, and so he so basically made the super pole then got on pole again and then in the race uh, drove a very strategic race actually again once again getting into battle with Gunther the third place guy in the list uh, but this time he let Gunther go fast and decided to trail behind him and slipstream him basically and uh, eventually near the end of the race got back in front of him pulled away and uh, won quite emphatically so even though he sacrificed the lead it was quite a canny move to save energy and so in the last stages of the race he wasn't really challenged so yeah good, good tactical driving great qualifying uh, despite being in group one uh, overcoming adversity, great overtakes. So, uh, there, yeah, there's a lot going for the Costa, but I think there's there's one better on the list, and that would be. Well, well I'll let you tell them in a moment, Jack. <laughs> well, yeah, the thing is, right. So our number one was Mitch Evans. Now, 
I know there might be some debate whether De Costa should be number one because he's leading the championship, but let me tell you why Mitch Evans is number one. And it's simple, really. He's in a Jaguar. If you look at that DS Chick Cheetah this season, it's still the best car on the grid. And I know De Costa, he's had a fantastic season. Probably his best season in Formula E at this precise And he's put he, Vern firmly in the brilliant. shade, his world exactly, champion team. so far. And, but Evans in that Jaguar has been stunning. You know, the, I go back to Santiago where he put it on pole. Yes, he didn't have the race pace, okay? But, you know, he, he still he managed to get the car home in a podium just because obviously he was overtaken by Nick DeFries and then but kept the podium. But then the race in Mexico was stunning. Like, he dominated that thing. And though getting second, he, was, he missed out to Andre Lodera for pole. But again, was arguably one of the quickest drivers across that weekend. Drove stunningly. Great move on Lottery. Yes, it was a bit aggressive. But just a fantastic drive. Dominated it. And he's in a Jaguar. It's not the best car on the grid. It's one of the better cars on the grid. For sure. Was, it is, but... was Mexico the first lights to flag win? Because the the, 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 only, the only other one I can think of is Nico Prost. It lights to final corner of the race in Beijing season one. I don't know. I think it was Prost on pole in London. It, yeah, in both, two, both uh, in, in one of those. Two, oh, possi- possibly, possibly, yeah. yeah. It's hard to say because we also had I car swaps think... as well back then. Yeah. I don't know. That's no, I don't know because I know he wasn't on pole. He was third actually. I don't think he was light, but obviously he would have been first corner. He, um, he, yeah. In, yes, on the yes, Sunday race, on the he would have been first corner. He would have been I think Jack uh, Pico is thinking more of the Saturday race, but anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't, down I can't remember if I can't remember if he was on pole on the Saturday race, but I know he, he was, wasn't he? Races. Yeah. He might have been because um, I, I think I, 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 I think it was Prost and Senna on the front row because everyone was loving that he in, was, um, yeah, in a Battersea. But yeah, for me, that's why Evans he's he's in a Jaguar and 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 what he's doing in it at the moment is, is brilliant, and I think he's probably one of the best drivers at this present moment on the grid in terms of his performance and that's what we were judging it on and uh, that's why i think mitch evans was number one so we've got one more topic to talk about before we end the show we've only got about four minutes boys so we've got to keep it brief okay and we've got i want to talk about oliver turvey because oliver turvey is probably one of the most underrated drivers and it's already been said by by the drivers you know, in videos when they talk about who you think is the most underrated driver that's not talked about much, and they all went Oliver Turvey, and they're right because what he's been doing in that Neo, and as that Neo progressively, sadly for Neo, gets worse and worse and worse, and the performance levels aren't really there. He's still managing to get something out of that car, get points, managed to get into Super Pole in Santiago, which was unfathomable when you looked at the testing pace. The team was a one and a half seconds off in Valencia, yet he manages to get the car into Super Pole. Like, Oliver Turvey doing Oliver Turvey things, really. But and that was something if, he couldn't if, do last year as well, so it wasn't yeah, surprising. If, if, Neo, if Neo was to stop today, say Neo said, right, we've... You know, we've we've gone. So we can't we can't race anymore. I I really think Oliver Turvey would not get a race seat in a Formula E drive again. Or he'd have to wait a season or two and someone was to drop in and say, oh, we need someone with experience. I think he'd miss the cut. Yeah, and that is a shame to think about. If you think back to the end of season four, John Paul Drio, who was obviously the boss of the uh, Nissan Edans team before he sadly passed away. He was asked directly, I remember, uh, oh, is Oliver Turvey on your shortlist? Oliver Turvey had got his first podium for Neo at the time and was performing quite well consistently. And he said, he was asked, oh, is Oliver Turvey, because uh, Nico Prost was retiring at the time, and he said that Oliver Turvey is on our shortlist. I remember that was the quote. And so it seems possible that Oliver Turvey has had offers from at least Nissan, if not other teams as well. And I've just uh, you can't see this, but I put the uh, Neo of Oliver Turvey cap that I've got on for this segment, um, and yeah, I um, it's definitely uh, disappointing as if, if anyone who's a fan of him to see him struggling in that uh, Neo 333 car. I definitely think that you say been going backwards. I definitely think the new ownership of the team is a positive because under the leadership, the, the team principal leadership of uh, Jerry Hughes, the team seemed to be going backwards each season the car was horrible in energy efficiency and 
yeah, they've gone for the, as you said earlier, the Dragon Penske uh, powertrain from last year, which is probably not the best one they could have gone for. But at the same time, it feels like they just did that as a sort of stopgap because they couldn't get uh, the because Neo were working on their own powertrain for season six, and then obviously when the um, free 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 China team took over, they obviously weren't impressed by what they saw. Yeah. So, so it's a question of is it um, Oliver Turvey's fault or is it uh, the team's fault that they've been so far behind? I guess is sort of the question here. Yeah. So what what boys in terms of Will or Jack? What I want to sort of say if do you see him if if Neil was to go or saying Neil was to replace him for whatever reason, right? I don't see that happening, but let's say it happened, right? Would you see Oliver Turvey getting a new seat? I find I I, I as I said I I would love to see it because I think he deserves it. But at the same time, I can see him being forgotten. Yeah. If you look at <clears throat> if you look at the grid, there are definitely some some drivers who I think he would do better than in the current seat. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at Felipe Massa at Venturi, you know he's not going any younger. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I, I would hazard a guess that Turvey could potentially do a job there. Um, potentially uh, in the second seat at Jaguar. Um, and there, there are a few other spots. None of the, neither of the Geox Dragon drivers are, are impressing. You know, all of these teams could potentially consider him. I mean, he, he has a, a really good record in in what's been a particularly poor car, and, and none of those drivers are are performing in, in what's much better machinery at the moment. Yeah, but you mentioned Felipe Massa at Venturi. Oh. I feel like the problem there is Oliver Turvey is not a big in, as big a name as Felipe Massa, and that's. I'm not saying the entire reason that Massa has the seat, but it's definitely a factor that he is Felipe Massa, eleven-time Formula One winner. But that, that's the thing is, like, I can't test him for McLaren. I, I agree with you in that sense. Like, um, I can't see him displacing Massa, but it's just like Massa is is pretty old now. I agree, but from a performance point of view, I definitely think Turvey is your better option. Yeah, but I think let's in terms of performance, I think Turvey, and in terms you have to think Formula E experience as well. Like Turvey has been it since the end of season in London, so he's been with that team since he's end not of season had one, a different yeah. team. He's not had a different team. He's been obviously the team name has changed. The team name has changed. It was Next TV and it's become Neo and now Neo Free Free Free. So the team name has changed. But in terms of experience, I think he he's got right to have you know a chance of maybe that Jaguar seat that you were talking about because obviously James Collard has come in he's it's, it's, it's struggled to get to grips with it he's had good performances in the race struggled in qualifying and that's where Turvey shines and he shines in the race as well so you'd think if you put Oliver Turvey in the Jaguar alongside Mitch Evans you'd have a great team you might have Mitch Evans might be the super quick one but you know Turvey would be there backing him up so I'm sure that you know it would work I, I understand that I think that would be a, a great fit for Oliver Turvey but what you I find Mostly is when drivers find themselves at the back of the grid, stuck in sort of limbo with one team that's not performing well, and they sort of just get forgotten about because new talent come in, new talent performs well, people want new drivers sometimes, and drivers like Oliver Turvey sometimes just get left behind. So I think we're running out of time, so I'm just going to wrap it up. Boys, I want to say a massive thank you for coming on for this first show. Uh, no problem, thank you. Enjoyed it. Yeah, cheers. That's um, a good fun. I just have yeah. to edit it all now. Uh, yeah. So what I want to say is, obviously, in terms of our, we're trying to real push content. Obviously, Monday to Friday would be great if you can join us along um, for the shows. Um, we're currently on 192 subscribers, and now we're setting ourselves a goal. Okay, we are setting ourselves a goal, and that goal is a thousand subscribers. Now it sounds like a lot, but you've got to dream big. You have to dream big. Go big or go well, home. Well, it's only eight more, I think, if yeah. I got the maths right. <laughs> so, well, I wish. It's not eight more to um, a thousand, is it? I'm, oh, oh, a thousand, oh, sorry. Some, yeah. oh. some, someone needs maths to, not my strong suit. Someone needs to go back to primary school, I think, <laughs> and, do his, and do his maths. But yeah, no, that's only 200, not like a thousand. You can sort that out, Fred, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can sort that out, Fred. I'll send him some of the homework that I'm setting my kids. Um, obviously... Obviously, this show at the moment, it's not going to last forever. This show um, it's just until probably the lockdown ends and, you know, life goes back to normal because everyone else here has different jobs that we'd go for. So it, we're going to just run this for as long as we possibly can and hopefully provide you with some great Formula E content. Um, also, if we have a Patreon page, we've got three amazing patrons and I'm, we're so thankful for them every single time that, you know, they carry on every month so if, if you want to help us support us help us get better equipment better places to maybe do this than our bedrooms 
Um, so that will be really helpful as well. Thank you so much for, for watching. You've been watching the FEZ show and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you.